Hello there and welcome to Inquiring Minds. My name is Doug and I'm back with another Pen Resurrection Sunday video. And a very Merry Christmas to those of you that celebrate and to those of you that don't celebrate, find something to celebrate and raise a glass of toast. A toast! A toast! A toast! To what? To... To toast. I love toast. Beverages of a sociable nature are encouraged but hot beverages are not, because I've been accused of causing serious burns from the spillage of hot coffees and teas during the more reasonable moments of my videos. You have been warned. I'm very funny. Today's fountain pen resurrection is this, 1948 Parker 51 Vacuumatic. It's part of a pen and pencil set that I bought at an antique dealer back in August. It has taken me this long to restore this pen because one, I needed to learn how to repair it, two, I needed to purchase the proper tools to repair it, and three, it took me a week just to get the pen apart. As a result, this video ends up being published on Christmas Day. So pull on your Christmas socks, grab an eggnog, and join me <coughs> as I restore this 75-year-old fountain pen right now. Today's fountain pen resurrection is this 75 year old 1948 Parker 51 Vacuumatic. What I'm going to do today is look at some of the history of this pen, show some before restoration photos and some restoration process videos, show some size comparisons, some measurements, and then provide a writing sample. 1948 was the last year of production of the Vacuumatic version of the Parker 51. The Parker 51 model was developed in 1939 and released just as the United States went to war in 1941. The vacuumatic version of the 51 was made by Parker from its introduction in 1941 until it was replaced by the Aerometric version in 1948. 1939, the year the pen was designed and developed, was the 51st anniversary of the founding of Parker Pens by George S. Parker in 1888 not to be confused with George S. Parker, founder of Parker Brothers of Monopoly fame, and also not to be confused with the P-51 Mustang, which was introduced almost at the same time as the Parker 51 in July 1940. George Parker wasn't an aviation enthusiast and was actually dead by 1937 in any event. But the reference to the P-51 Mustang isn't far-fetched, as the longtime CEO of the Parker Pen Company in 1939 was George's son Kenneth, who was an avid aviator, and the Parker Pen Company had quite a fleet of aircraft. So it's very possible the in-development Parker 51 was named after the in-development P-51 Mustang. Kenneth Parker did order the introduction of a stainless steel version of the Parker 51 called the Flighter in 1949. Parker continued making the Parker 51 until 1972, an amazing 31 years. They sold between 20 and 50 million Parker 51s. Here's what this pen looked like when I found it at a local antique shop. I bought it with this matching pencil for $110 Canadian. Since I had to concentrate on doing the restoration as this was the first Parker 51 vacuumatic I worked on, I decided to film but not talk while I was working. So I'm going to narrate what I was doing in the various steps. The first thing I did was disassemble the cap into pieces. This top jewel is a piece of pearlescent gray plastic that can be removed by pressing and turning with a piece of elastic rubber. That piece comes off and reveals a brass screw. I unscrewed it with a slot screwdriver and the clip comes right off. I polished the gold filled clip with some semi-chrome like polishing compound and then buffed it with a jeweler's cloth. There's a plastic cap seal that is now loose inside the cap, but I couldn't get it out because I don't have the special tool to get the clutch mechanism out first. But that was okay because I soaked the cap in pen flush and it cleaned up nicely. And then I used the Simicrone polish to polish the Lustreloy cap until it sparkled. To reassemble the cap, I inserted a rod into the cap to push the cap liner to the top and screwed the brass screw back in and replaced the top jewel. It's a good thing I didn't make a video of the procedure for removing the hood because the video would be three days long. The one thing I learned in my research on how to remove these hoods was patience. So I did a cycle of three things, dry heat, 
attempt to unscrew the hood, and then soak in an ultrasonic bath of pen flush. I repeated that procedure over and over for three days, leaving the pen in the pen flush overnight. When it finally let loose, it was exhilarating, and I'm convinced that it wasn't the shellac that was holding it so tight, but old ink that had been petrified over years and years of sitting unused. I removed the nib, feed, and breather tube, and soaked them in the ultrasonic bath, and then went at them with a toothbrush and pen flush until they were clean. I polished the nib with semi-chrome and then with my jeweler's cloth. Then I went after the hood and the body of the pen. The pen was badly scratched and so my polishing procedure for the hood, the barrel and the blind cap was to sand them with progressive grits of micromesh from 2400 to 3200 and then 6000 grit. Then I polished them with Meguiar's Swirl Remover 2.0 polishing compound until they were gleaming. And I avoided the already very faint Parker imprint at the top of the barrel of the pen. As you can see, now the ink collector nib and feed are almost like new. This is how it comes apart. You pull the ink collector straight out and then pull the nib and feed from the collector. You can see here how beautifully the 14 karat gold nib polished up. I'll read the imprints here because once back in the pen, they're hidden. The nib says Parker, made in Canada, with 1948 on the bottom right and 14K on the bottom left of the nib. The feed comes straight out of the collector and then you can pull the breather tube straight out of the feed. The ink collector took several hours of work teasing out the particles of petrified ink. The breather tube was also clogged with ink, so I took a guitar string and poked it through the tube until all the ink was cleared. Then I polished the ebonite feed with Meguiar's polishing compound. To put the front section of the pen together again, insert the breather tube into the feed and notice there is a small hole in the feed right here that needs to be clean and clear of debris. Then slide the feed and the breather tube back into the ink collector, being careful to observe the orientation. There is a wide channel and a narrow channel on the top and bottom of the collector and you need to line up the bottom of the feed with the wide channel. Then you can slide the nib onto the feed in the correct orientation to the collector and push it in all the way. Now here comes the special part of the restore. In order to get the vacuumatic pump out of the pen, I needed to buy a special extractor tool. I bought this from the Inky Nib. You'll find Scott's store on eBay called the Inky Nib, which is all one word. The tool works great, but it costs more than this pen. The good news is it will work for all vacuumatics, the large and the small versions. I purchased a replacement sack from the Pen Dragons. Uh, you'll find their store on Etsy called Pen Sacks and Parts, again all one word. I also got a couple of pellet pushers, as you'll see in a moment. Here is the vacuumatic removal tool. You take the correct size collet and screw it onto the end of the pen. Then you place the grip on the collet and screw it down tight. Then you can unscrew the vacuumatic pump from the pen. Of course it looks easy here because I'd already removed it and cleaned it, but that pump was as stuck as the hood. After a lot of soaking but no heat, I got it to budge. But the unit wouldn't come out of the barrel. Having removed the ink collector, I just inserted the flat end of the pellet pusher into the other end of the barrel and tapped the vacuumatic unit out. There was petrified sack inside the barrel that I had to scrape and clean out with some tube brushes, but the unit was in excellent shape and the pellet was still attached. I was able to pull the pellet out quite easily, which is not always the case. Then I needed to attach the new sack to the pump unit, so I put the pellet pusher inside the sack and pressed the pellet into the pellet cup. From research, I learned I needed to trim the sack to between 27 and 30 millimeters. I chose to trim it to 29 millimeters. Once I had it trimmed, I inserted the other end of the pellet pusher into the sack and gave the sack a light coating of talc so it wouldn't stick to itself. Then you just roll the sack back on itself until it gets to the ring on the pump. And I stole this little tip from Steph at Grand Mia Pens. 
Just a little bit of soapy water around both ends of the sack will allow the unit to slide into the barrel much easier. I put the unit into the barrel, hand tight, and tested it to see if it worked correctly. Then I tightened it with the extraction tool. I slid the ink collector back into the barrel with the Parker imprint facing down. Then it's a matter of trial and error to get the hood and the nib to line up, just adjusting it over and over again until it's perfect. Usually at this point, you'll put some shellac on these threads and seal the hood in place. But not being sure whether I'm actually done with the nib, I chose to just coat the threads with some silicone grease. It works really nicely on my Wingsung 601 Flighter. Finally, the moment of truth. I inked the pen for the first time and tried a writing sample. To my surprise, it wrote beautifully. Let's take a closer look at this newly restored pen. From the top, we see the pearlescent plastic finial jewel surrounded by the clip ring and then the double line Parker Blue Diamond Arrow clip. The blue diamond represented the lifetime warranty from Parker. After 1948, Parker changed to the single arrow and dropped the blue diamond. And here is a 1954 Parker 51 that has the updated arrow. It is often said that the US Supreme Court banned the lifetime warranty in 1948, but this is a misunderstanding of the court case. Companies, not just pen companies, were offering lifetime warranties to hype their products, but charging large warranty service fees to recoup their repair cost. The court case ruled that companies could continue to offer lifetime warranties, but if they charged extra fees for service, that had to be indicated in the advertising. So most companies dropped the practice. Parker called the matte stainless steel cap Lustreloy. The cap tapers to a single groove at the end. Later models would have Parker and other text engraved at the end of the cap, like on the 1954 version. There's an almost imperceptible step down to the DuPont Lucite plastic barrel, which tapers up slightly and then tapers down to the rounded end. At the top of the barrel, there's a very faint imprint that reads Parker 51, made in Canada, and an 8 with a dot on it. This is the Parker dating system, which has the last digit of the year of manufacture and a series of dots indicating the quarter of that year. Three dots indicated the first quarter, and in each subsequent quarter, a dot was filed off, leaving none for the fourth quarter. So this pen was made in the third quarter of 1948. And here you can see the seam between the blind cap and the barrel, and there is the plastic vacuumatic uh, push rod. The cap slips off in one of the finest examples of capping and uncapping ever created on a fountain pen. The only pen that does this better, in my opinion, is the Pilot E95S. The capping mechanism on this is silky smooth, just sublime. With the cap off, we see the other major innovation in fountain pen design, the tapering black plastic section and hooded 14 karat gold nib. This was a revolution in fountain pen design. The hood keeps the nib from drying out when uncapped especially when combined with Parker's other innovation, the Parker 51 quick drying ink. The result was a pen that was always ready to write and which wrote a line that wouldn't smear as easily as regular fountain pen. It also made for a sleek, modern for the times looking fountain pen that is smooth and balanced in the hand, especially when it's posted, as it becomes one of the most ergonomic pens ever designed. You can just see the tip of the small 14 karat gold nib poking out of the hood and just the tip of the ebonite feed. Inside the hood is a revolutionary ink collector system. A small plastic siphon tube, like a tiny straw, goes from the feed through the ink collector and into the middle of the barrel. When you press on the vacuumatic rod, the rubber sack inside the barrel extends, forcing ink or air out. When the sack is retracted by the spring, a vacuum is created in the barrel and ink is drawn up through the siphon tube. Multiple pumps will fill the ink chamber with around 1.6 milliliters of ink. If you've held a Parker 51 in your hands, you'll know how it feels. It's instantly comfortable, light, and sleek. Your grip can be anywhere on the pen, and long writing sessions cause little, if any, hand fatigue. It's a marvel of engineering and design, form and function coming together perfectly. 
it isn't hard to see why these pens were hugely popular and Parker sold millions of them. And here, 75 years later, this pen writes beautifully and the Parker 51 models from 1941 through 1972 are extremely popular with collectors. It's also easy to see how horribly wrong the new Parker 51 design is. This is a Jinhao 85 and is a clone of the new Parker 51. It wasn't hard for Jin Hao to copy the new Parker 51 design because they make it for Parker. The gold nib versions of this pen are made in France, but all the others are made in China. The knowledge, expertise, and will to remake the classic Parker 51 seems to have disappeared from Parker over the years of the company changing hands over and over. The best modern version of the Parker 51 is, in my opinion, the Wingsung 601. Here is my 601 flighter on which I've installed a stainless steel hood and a Bobby Mini Fude nib. It's a magnificent pen and one of my favorites. Now let's look at some size comparisons. And here is the 1948 Parker 51 Vacumatic with a 1954 Parker 51 Aerometric, a Wingsung 601 flighter, a 1967 Parker 45 Insignia, and a modern Waterman Karen Black Seas. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. These are some of the best posting fountain pen designs ever. You can see they're all relatively the same size and post beautifully. The Parker 45 design really knocks it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. Now let's look at them unposted. And here they are unposted. You can see that the Parker 45 and the Karen have extremely long sections. The 45 being the longest and the smoothest and the most comfortable as far as I'm concerned. These are all gold nibs, except for the Wingsung 601 Flighter, which has a steel nib. Now let's look at some measurements and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Clairefontaine 90 GSM paper, and this is the 1948 Parker 51 Vacumatic with a 14 karat gold fine nib. Let's check the wetness. For a fine nib, I was very surprised at how wet this pen is. And the nib is super smooth. Which again, surprised me because I'm used to fine nibs actually having quite a bit of feedback to them, almost naturally. But this fine nib is very, very smooth indeed. I've been writing with this pen since I first inked it up after restoring it last week. Now, I'm not a fan of fine nibs, but I really enjoy writing with this pen. And the ink today is the only ink I put in a vintage pen with a sack, and that is Waterman's Serenity Blue. And here are some close matches to this ink from inkswatch.com. As to line variation, well, these small hooded nibs don't have any flexibility to them at all. So, and none is expected. So you're not going to get any line variation. They just aren't designed for that. And the line this nib makes is 0 0.5 millimeters, which makes it a Western fine, as you'd expect and a Japanese fine to medium. And for our quote. And for some reverse writing. Well, that's surprising as well. It's very wet. It's uh, not a lot thinner and it's very smooth. 
Saw this nib writes in both directions almost identically. And some quick writing. No issues whatsoever. Very nice. So my thoughts on this restoration. This has been my most satisfying fountain pen restoration to date. It's probably the most expensive as well, as I paid $110 Canadian for the pen and pencil set, and another $100 for parts, supplies, and tools to do the restoration. But it's totally worth it. Researching the construction of the vacuumatic, learning the restoration procedure, and finding the required tools, and then actually being successful at bringing this pen back from the dead, has been an exhilarating experience. So much so that I'm searching out other Parker Vacuumatics in need of repair so I can do it all over again. The fact that I've ended up with a pen that writes so beautifully is just icing on the cake. The only hooded nib fountain pen I liked previous to this one was my Wingsong 601 Flighter. Damn it. The only hooded nib fountain pen I liked previous to this one was my Wingsong 601 Flighter, as it has a mini Fude nib that gives tons of line character with no effort. Plus, it's really pretty in steel. But this old Parker 51 with its mid-century design charm, wonderfully wet and smooth nib, and huge ink capacity is surprisingly attractive to me. I'm quite surprised at that. I'd considered selling the pen and pencil set after it was restored, but now I'm thinking of keeping it, even if only because it's been the source of so much pleasure in the restoration process and results. And there you have it. Thanks to all of you who are enjoying and supporting my pen resurrection series. These restoration videos take three times as much work and get a third of the reviews as regular pen reviews, but they're twice as satisfying for me. So comments and support from you vintage pen fans are greatly appreciated. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. And please look in the description for a link to Goldspot Pens, as I'm now an affiliate of the online store, and when you shop at Goldspot using my link, you'll be supporting my channel as well at no extra charge to you. You can also join as a member of my channel too for only 99 cents a month and I guarantee I'll answer your comments in the comment section and you'll get cool emojis, badges, and sneak peek unboxing videos as well. And that just leaves it for me to say thank you for watching. And that's all she wrote. this.